Hi, my name is Philip Tennant. I'm an engineer here at Data Theorem. And today I'm going to be talking about some of uh, what's new and what's changed in iOS 14 in terms of security and in terms of privacy. Um, so of course, every year, Apple and Google release their new operating systems to go along with their new devices. And every year, they also add new APIs and changes for developers to take advantage of new platform security features. Um, so every year when Apple does this, we, of course, here at Data Theorem, dig into these releases and find out what's changed and, and, and what developers need to do to stay compliant. Um, and we do all of that research on your behalf and work this into the analyzer. Uh, but we did want to give you this briefing so you would be aware of some of the changes that are being made. Um, so at a high level, uh, iOS 14 in particular brings some changes in terms of user privacy, as well as offering some new APIs that developers can leverage to increase security within their apps. Um, so broadly, iOS 14 adds support for uh, some new access controls around some really sensitive stores of content on the device. These are things like the user's photos, uh, their location, the user's clipboard, and their health data. Um, and iOS 14 also improves sort of the quality of life with some platform security features, uh, things like autofill, universal links, sign in with Apple, et cetera. Uh, this release also brings forward some new modern protocols uh, and networking APIs that apps can use to make sure that all of the data in transit within the app uh, happens over a secure connection as well as relatedly bringing improvements to web security uh, when the app is using WebKit. Um, at WWDC this year, Apple also offered some security tips, some security gotchas that developers should watch out for. And we thought that that would, that would be useful to pass along to developers as well. So we'll go over that. Uh, and then if you're interested at the end, We'll also be talking about some, some interesting things that Apple added this year with iOS 14. These are APIs that you can use to monitor uh, the power impact and performance profile of your application and to do automatic regression tests in production, as well as some of the really cool hardware security features that are coming with uh, Mac OS on Apple Silicon. Um, so just so you're aware, uh, many of these changes that we will be talking about are things that are going to make their way into the Data Theorem Analyzer uh, as we count down to the release of iOS 14. Uh, and so this presentation is sort of a high level of what to be aware of and some of the things that you may start to see pop up in your portal um, over the next three months on the way to late September. Okay, so up first, we'll talk about some of the changes to Photos Library access. So of course, uh, as we all know, the Photos Library is one of the most sensitive stores of content on the user's device. They really don't want these you know, to leak. There could be very sensitive information in there. Uh, but unfortunately, all too often, we see apps requesting full permission to the user's photo library when really, uh, they only really need a photo or two. You know, a few photos may suffice, but exposing all of the user's photos to the application tends to be superfluous. Uh, so the change here with iOS 14 is that Apple is introducing new controls to try and pare down the scope of data that gets exposed to the application, both when an app does request access to the user's photos and when the application decides that, in fact, it only needs a photo or two and is not going to request full access. And we'll look at both of these in turn, but we'll take a look at this one first. So if an app still does choose to request full access to the user's photo library, the user has this new option on the uh, photos permission prompt that says select photos. Um, so the way that this works is rather than granting the app access to their full photo library, um, the user can choose to only expose a subset of their photos instead. And Apple made this really nice graphic to show exactly how this works. So in the prior model, your app would request the photos permission from the user. And once the user had granted access, you would interact with these PhotoKit APIs. Um, and then behind the scenes, the PhotoKit APIs would mediate the connection between your app and the raw photos database. Um, but now in the new model with iOS 14, if the user has selected to only expose a limited subset uh, of their library, nothing changes for your app. You, you still request the user permission. You still talk to the same PhotoKit APIs, but rather than talking directly to the photos database, you know, behind the scenes, you're instead mediated by this limited library selection that the user has chosen to expose. Um, 
And a couple important things to note here. Firstly, if you do need to know whether the user has granted full access to the photo library, Apple has added some new APIs to this effect. Um, but also it's really important to note that this applies to all apps running on iOS 14, not just those that have been updated to use iOS 14 as their base SDK. Um, so once again, there are very few use cases for where an app really needs full access to the user's contact library, excuse me, photos library. This only really makes sense if you're making maybe a, a backup application or maybe some you know, bulk photo editor, but generally apps don't need this. And so Apple is um, sort of giving the control to the user to, if apps still do do this, um, they're not necessarily going to see that full amount of data. Um, but it would be even better if the app doesn't need to request that photo's permission at all. So Apple has this new API called PH Picker. And the way that this works is that if the app knows, okay, I don't need full access to the user's photo library, I only need you know, a couple photos, maybe to upload a profile picture or send an image to a contact, um, you don't have to request the photo's permission at all. Rather that you can just use this API, PH Picker, and what this will do is it'll inform iOS to present a Photos Picker UI on top of the application to the user um, that allows the user to select a photo and then provide it back to the app. And this is pretty cool because the app can't actually interact with this PH Picker UI at all. Uh, a malicious app could not, for example, you know, intentionally screenshot this UI to reveal uh, photos from the user. Uh, this UI is totally, uh, it's out of process, it's rendered on top of the app's context, but not within the app. So it's impossible for, uh, for an app to interact with this, except for whatever the user has chosen to expose. Um, so this is really similar to an existing API called UI Image Picker Controller, which was introduced around iOS 11. And of, of course, this UI Image Picker Controller API is something that we've been recommending for quite a while uh, but with iOS 14, Apple has introduced this new API, PH Picker, which serves as uh, the same functionality, but this is its more modern replacement. Um, and it does offer some advantages over UI Image Picker Controller. Specifically, you have this, this revamped UI um, with search functionality and this grid view that's very similar to the iOS 13 Photos app. Uh, and additionally, it allows the user to select multiple photos at a time. Okay, so moving on to location, Apple made a very similar change uh, to the location access prompt. So now when an app does request access to the user's location, rather than getting a precise reading of where the user is, the app instead only gets an approximate, uh, an approximate reading. Um, and there are some code changes here. So it's not automatically enabled for all apps like this new photos permission is, but rather it's opt-in uh, via this new app manifest key, and this location default accuracy reduced, that app developers can say they're able to handle this approximate location. And as you can see, if an app does opt into this, uh, there's just this nice new toggle on the, on the location prompt. Um, and of course, there might be times where you do, in fact, need to upgrade from an approximate location to a precise one. This might be, for example, if you're uh, providing turn-by-turn -turn directions to the user. So Apple has also added new APIs to this effect. You can add another new key to your app manifest, this NS Location Temporary Usage Description Dictionary, which informs the user that uh, you, you just want to access their precise location for a very well-scoped um, temporary purpose. Um, and then once again, similarly to the limited photos library, if you do need to check what access level you've been granted, Apple has added new APIs to where you can ask whether you've been given access to an approximate reading of location or a precise one. Um, moving on to another very similar sensitive content store on the device, uh, iOS 14 will now notify the user via this, this uh, UI interaction when an app is accessing the user's clipboard in the background. So in general, the user's clipboard is, is, is uh, a store of content that apps may read and write from. But what Apple has seen is that some apps will continuously read uh, from the user's clipboard in the background, you know, every few seconds. And they would do this optimistically as a, 
as, a, as sort of a surreptitious data collection mechanism. And so Apple's caught on to this and they're putting this sort of um, this, this info in the hands of the user so that when an app is doing this, the user sees right away. And it's sort of this name and shame strategy against apps uh, doing this or embedding analytics SDKs that do this. Um, and in fact, it's worked quite well so far. So even before iOS 14 has been released to the public, there have been quite a number of news stories um, about, for example, TikTok and another 50 or so apps that were named and shamed for, for this sort of behavior. So if you are accessing the user's clipboard within your app, you should make sure that it's very um, sort of understandably done or that it's tied to a UI action that the user performs. Because if it's not, if the user didn't click a button, which they would expect to initiate a clipboard read, and they just see this alert, it can look very scary to the user. And it, ma it makes them ask a lot of questions about what the app is doing. Um, and lastly, in terms of user data, um, that's now being sort of bubbled up to the user in terms of more control. Uh, iOS 14 also has revamped this consent screen for granting access to health data. Uh, to an application. So as you can see here, there's now this new three-step process that the user has to click through. Um, this middle one here uh, shines a big light on the app's privacy policy. Um, and one important thing to note here is that Apple says that if you are ac accessing health data, if you are requesting health data from the user, which is of course extremely sensitive, um, they will manually review your privacy policy. So make sure that all of this is thoroughly documented. You can also see in this consent screen that the user uh, is asked to click through that Apple has these, these bullet points here that um, really sort of call out to the user that sharing this data with an application could allow them to infer quite a lot of info about you and that the user should think about this decision because of course, uh, medical data or any prescriptions the user might have is very, very sensitive. Um, and they also ask the user to make the decision whether all health data should be shared with the application or only the health data that exists up to the point where the app has requested permission. Uh, in other words, whether the app should continue receiving new health records as time goes on or whether they should just see whatever you've already recorded within the health app. Um, and along the same lines of health data, uh, Apple has introduced some new APIs that make working with health data a bit easier. So if you're not aware, health data comes in this standardized format called the FHIR format, um, which was previously returned as a JSON structure. Uh, and the issue here that Apple identified was that it meant that every app that interacted with health data had to model uh, this, this FHIR JSON. It had to build out you know, data modeling and error handling and validations for, for all of the structures that could be represented within the FHIR um, within the FHIR protocol. Um, and, and these data structures can get very complex. For example, a prescription can have a lot of, you know, sort of exceptions and, and, and stipulations. So Apple saw people getting this wrong. And so with iOS 14, they've introduced this Swift module called FHIR models, which are pre-built data structures that you can use in your app to manipulate uh, and parse and validate FHIR data. Uh, so Apple has open sourced this on GitHub it allows developers to get data validation um, of FHIR data with you know, very little work on their ends. And it also supports multiple versions of the FHIR standard. Um, so the FHIR standard is, is you know, sort of reworked every few years, and there are a couple major variations that are in use across the industry. And FHIR models in include support for parsing several of these. Um, moving on to secure networking in the app. Uh, so Apple has introduced some more modern protocols around secure networking, and they've also put some more control into the hands of the user to be aware when apps are doing uh, things that involve the network that they're maybe not necessarily consenting to. Um, and once again, we'll take a look at this one first, this locking down local network scanning. Um, so the idea here is that the, uh, the user's device is broadcasting some signal, but then they also have a variety of signals around them. Uh, devices broadcasting signals around them rather. These might be things like, uh, like Wi-Fi routers, Bluetooth speakers, uh, game controllers, printers, anything around the user that's, that's also broadcasting. Um, 
And what Apple has noticed is that some analytics firms would be using this map of devices around the users as a way to track the user's location, um, even when the user hasn't otherwise granted any kind of location permission. So in other words, these analytics firms would keep track of what devices were around the user at any given time and consider this some kind of location point. And then if they see those same devices around the user again, they use that as a hint to say, okay, the user is in this location or that location. Uh, all of this happening without any sort of knowledge or, or consent on part of the user. Um, so the change here is that with iOS 14, if you do do any of this local network scanning, this interaction with devices around the user, you now need to ask the user for permission before you can do so. Um, and if you do use these APIs and um, uh, the user hasn't granted permission or they've denied permission, um, these APIs will just, just fail. They won't return you a, a valid result. Uh, so there's another new info P list or rather app manifest description key that you can add to request this permission from the user. Um, so these are NS local network usage description. If you want to use some of these APIs that scan the local network. Uh, and then if you do want to interact with nearby devices via the, via the Bonjour protocol, there's also this new NS Bonjour services uh, manifest key that you need to declare. Um, and important to note here that this local network scanning, uh, it doesn't include connections to remote hosts, that is like internet hosts, but any kind of multicast or broadcast, you will need to request access um, before you can use these APIs. One important thing to note is that Apple says that their first party APIs that allow you to interact with devices that are nearby to the user inherently protect privacy. And therefore, if you are using these APIs, these Apple APIs, you don't need to request the permission. So if you're using things like AirPlay, AirPrint, AirDrop, or HomeKit, uh, you're free to connect to devices around you via these APIs without asking the user first. Uh, and Apple has provided this, this breakdown of exactly when you do versus don't need to request permission from the user. So again, any connections to remote hosts, that is, you know, TCP, UDP to any remote server, you're fine. As well as if you're interacting with local devices via these high level Apple APIs like AirPrint, AirPlay, HomeDrop, AirDrop and HomeKit. Um, but if you are connecting to local hosts in any way, or you're using uh, Bonjour, or you're using anything sort of customer low level like multicast and broadcast, you will need to ask the user um, before you can use these. And Apple does ask you to watch out because there are some frameworks that you may indirectly be triggering this behavior from. So just be aware that you could indirectly be using Bonjour through the network framework via these APIs listed here, through foundation, multi-peer connectivity, or these lower level POSIX APIs. Um, and similarly, if you do want to do this uh, sort of low-level multicast and broadcast, you now need to request a specific permission from Apple. Um, right, so moving on to secure DNS resolution. Uh, so if you're not aware, DNS resolution is the process of taking a domain name like apple.com and then talking to a remote DNS server to map that back to an IP address where that domain uh, can currently be reached at. Um, and in older versions of DNS lookup, there are a few problems with this protocol. Uh, the, the biggest one is that DNS resolution happens over an insecure connection. There's no encryption or, or you know, any, anything like that enforced on the DNS connection, meaning that any third party on the network could not only you know, see, store, sell, or share what domains you're connecting to, via the DNS resolutions that they see, but they could even perform a man-in-the-middle man attack and redirect you to a different IP address from the one that you intended to reach. Um, and then the second issue here is that the user might not necessarily trust the DNS provider that they've been set up with. Uh, a DNS provider is normally something that's configured by an ISP or uh, by a wireless carrier, an MDM. Um, so it's not necessarily uh, a party that the user uh, inherently trusts. And with iOS 14, Apple is tackling both of these issues. Uh, so we'll take a look at this one first, encrypting DNS connections across the system. 
So Apple is introducing support for two protocols that allow this DNS connection to be encrypted and verified. These are DNS over TLS or DOT and DNS over HTTPS or DOH. Um, and this coexists with other higher level networking mechanisms like VPN or MDMs. Um, and there are also some cool features like these, the iOS will automatically search for uh, DNS servers that support DOH. It uh, doesn't need to be configured manually. But in terms of addressing the second problem of making sure that you're talking to a DNS server that you trust, Apple has provided two controls around this. Uh, so this is the first one and the one that we sort of expect most um, DNS configurations to go through. So what happens here is that if you're a DNS provider, such as you know Cloudflare or whoever else, you can create a special new kind of app called a network extension app that will configure the system to system-wide talk to your DNS provider rather than a different one. Um, and then if you're an NDM, you can do a very similar thing where you construct a payload that will configure the system to use the DNS provider of your choice. Um, but Apple has also built in this sort of safety hatch uh, for developers at the lower level. So if you like, as a developer, you can decide on a per connection basis how uh, you want your DNS resolution to happen so that you can enforce secure DNS, even if the rest of the system isn't using secure DNS yet. Um, and the way that you do this is that support has been added in all of these existing network APIs. These are URL session, the network framework, and get address info. Um, Apple has also noticed that some Wi-Fi networks, uh, you know, those networks that, that really want to spy on you, will intentionally block the connection if they see that you're using encrypted DNS. And so with iOS 14, Apple has added some built-in detection for when this happens. Um, so it will alert the user that uh, it sees that the Wi-Fi network is intentionally blocking encrypted DNS lookup, and it'll explain to the user exactly what's going on here. Moving on to TLS, there's a very similar issue with older versions of the TLS protocol. So the way that this works is when a device and a remote server want to set up a connection, uh, they perform something called the TLS handshake, where uh, the device and the remote server agree on a protocol. Um, and in the process of, of exchanging all this data, there's, there's also an exchange of something called the SNI, the server name, which is essentially the domain name that you're talking to. And this, once again, is transmitted in plain text. Uh, so again, any third party on the network could observe what domains you're talking to. Um, and there's been a lot of effort around um, creating a new version of the TLS protocol, which doesn't leak this piece of information. So the term that you might hear here is ESNI, encrypted server name identification. And Apple wants it to be known that they're working with the standards body, with the IETF, to standardize a future version of TLS that doesn't leak this information. Um, iOS 14 also has support from, for some more modern networking protocols like TLS 1.3 and HTTP 3, um, both of which improve the security and performance of network connections. So TLS 1.3 improves performance by um, removing one round trip, one, you know, um, message that needs to be sent from the device to the server and vice versa from the TLS handshake, meaning that connections are established faster. And additionally, parts of the protocol have been formally verified, ensuring that there are no uh, sort of deep problems with the spec. Uh, and it also allows for less potential misconfigurations when setting up a connection directly. Uh, there's also support for this new feature called multipath TCP. Uh, and the intent of this is to provide more reliability on the connection when the user is moving between networks that might be flaky uh, or moving between various wireless networks. Um, so this feature, multipath TCP, is now available via an opt-in switch that developers can enable on their connections. And TLS 1.3 in general is now the default on iOS 14. Um, as I mentioned, similarly with HTTP 3, this is the successor to HTTP 2, which has been the standard for quite a while. Uh, and it's sort of like the new, very modern version of HTTP 3. You may also hear this referred to as QUIC. Um, 
And so with iOS 14, HTTP3 is, an, is available via an opt-in switch that the user can enable. Um, so there are two of these. The user can opt-in um, via a switch for the URL session API, and then they can also opt-in within web views via an experimental switch in the Safari WebKit settings. Um, when Apple was giving these updates on these more not modern networking APIs, they reiterated that developers should be using the high-level uh, networking APIs. Uh, and this gives you quite a, quite a number of benefits, but foremost among them is that you get these, these modern protocols and these, this improved security and performance that Apple provides with very little to no work on your end. If you just use the high-level APIs, then the lower level details can change without you really needing to be aware uh, or do much work um, to take advantage of these things. They also reiter reiterated that IPv6 support is an app store requirement. Um, and this is another one of those things that we here at Data Theorem have been pointing out for quite a while. But just in case, if you are using any of the older IPv4 only APIs, this is something that Apple says, um, you know, is not allowed on the App Store and that you should migrate to the uh, newer APIs that support IPv6 as soon as possible. They also pointed out that IPv6 uh, in general has better performance than IPv4, mostly because of things like um, generally newer network equipment associated with IPv6 connections than with IPv4 and that there's less routing involved because um, you can address you know, uh, more of the network at once. So moving on to autofill, uh, this was a system introduced by Apple around the iOS 10 days. And what it allows you to do is it allows you as the developer to inform iOS of where various kinds of data types, data fields within your application are. So you can tell iOS that, okay, here is a, uh, a username field, here's a password field, uh, and if you do this, if you hint to the system about where your fields are in this way, um, it allows iOS to do some neat things like auto-filling the user's credentials for them, or uh, as shown in this screenshot, even suggesting strong credentials for the user to use. Um, so annotating these fields to the system is a big win for security because it means that the user has to do a lot less work to uh, sort of store and manage and input secure credentials, resulting in a net security win for your users. If it's more convenient and less hassle to use secure passwords, users will do it more frequently. Um, and the change here is that with iOS 14, Apple is expanding this autofill support to more types of data fields. So with iOS 14, you can now uh, inform the system about where more types of this data is and it'll allow the system to input this data for the user instead of having to type it in. So specifically with iOS 14, uh, the app developer can now hint where email addresses, telephone numbers, and physical addresses are. Um, and then also uh, kind of interesting in macOS Big Sur, the uh, new macOS release that goes alongside iOS 14, AppKit support, supports what um, what iOS did a few years ago, in that on macOS, you can now uh, annotate where your username and password fields are, and it'll allow macOS to autofill those for the user. And one cool thing here that in fact is not available in iOS, um, but on macOS, uh, they now support third-party password managers as data sources for the inputted information. So if you do track all your passwords on Mac with uh, a password manager like 1Password, um, that can now be used as a source for the information to autofill. Um, so this is what this looks like. Here an app has annotated its uh, destination field and the system sees that the user was just looking at this restaurant saying Yelp and it allows the system to provide this intelligent suggestion right above the keyboard. Um, Apple also stressed that developers should be as precise as possible when annotating their text fields. Um, so there are a lot of options that you can use to say exactly the type of data uh, that a text field is intended to take. But if you're as precise and specific as possible with what the text field needs, 
It allows the system to uh, suggest the right piece of information exactly when the user needs it. Um, so Apple did sort of give a breakdown of how they, how they would like developers to use this technology. And they did this by sort of painting a, a flow chart from worst to best in terms of um, user kind of annoyance and of data exposure if an app wanted to have the user provide a contact uh, that they could use for some operation. So in the worst case, in terms of uh, user impact and data exposure, the app would request access to the user's contacts and then would have some custom UI uh, that it would use to allow the user to scroll through and select a contact to use. Um, this is really not good from a data exposure perspective because it means that you need to start worrying about a huge amount of data, all of the user's contacts, and whether any of that information is exposed in your app. Um, and then additionally, it means that you have to do a lot of development and maintenance work on these custom views to present these contacts to the user. Um, so slightly better than this is if you use this CN Contacts View Controller API, which was introduced a few years ago. Uh, and this is really similar to that permissionless photos library API that we spoke about earlier in that it allows the app to uh, have the system present a contact contacts picker to the user without the app needing to request access to the user's contacts uh, at all. So this is definitely better. It's rendered out of process. It's presented by the system. None of the user's contacts are um, exposed to the app. Um, but it's still not perfect because it means that the user is sort of taken out of your app, put into this system UI where they select a contact and then they go back to your app. So it's a bit of, bit of user interruption there. So in the best case, Apple says that they would like to see developers just annotating their text fields. And this allows the system to intelligently suggest them to the user with you know, absolutely no interruption to the user flow within your app. Okay, so moving on to universal links. This is a system that was introduced by Apple a few years ago as a replacement for this custom URI schemes mechanism. Um, so if you're not aware, this custom URI schemes mechanism uh, that Apple was replacing had some security issues that universal links fixes. And so because of this, they uh, really stressed at WWDC this year that apps should be moving away from custom URI schemes as soon as possible and using universal links instead. Um, they also made some improvements to the universal links system um, that are relevant to the security issue with custom URI schemes. Okay, so in short, the security issue with custom URI schemes is, um, this is a system where if I want my app to be able to handle a special kind of URL, if I was using the older insecure custom URI schemes mechanism, what I would do is I would say in my app manifest file, okay, iOS, I know how to handle um, URLs that match this style. And then when the user would click on a link that matches that style, it would be routed to your app. So the issue here comes up if a malicious application says that they can also handle your URLs. What might happen here is that iOS won't know which app is, is telling the truth. It can really handle the URL and it might choose to launch the malicious app uh, and pass that URL rather than your app. Uh, and this leads to potential data exposure because apps very frequently pass along information um, such as a token or some piece of PII uh, within these URLs. Um, so universal links is the new secure mechanism that allows an app to associate itself with a URL um, without the security pitfalls that custom URI schemes had. So the way that this works is with universal links, you still tell the system, here is my domain name that I'm associated with, but rather than, um, but what happens is that the domain also needs to declare that it is associated with your app. And the way that this works is that there's a special metadata file that needs to be hosted on the website, this Apple app site association file, needs to be present on the web domain um, that contains information about the app that it's associated with. So in summary, Universal Links solves the security issue of apps 
uh, malicious apps hijacking URI schemes by requiring this two-way system of trust via the app saying that it um, is associated with this domain and the domain also saying that it's associated with that app. Um, so Apple did make a change to the system with iOS 14, but it requires a little bit more background. So the way that this works is that when, an, when iOS does install an app that has a universal link associated with it, uh, iOS will then reach out to that domain looking for this piece of metadata, this Apple app site association file. Um, and so what could happen is if there are you know, millions of people downloading your app all at the same time, you could potentially see millions of requests to your domain from iOS devices requesting this Apple app site association file. And Apple saw that this was quite a burden for some domains. So they've now introduced a dedicated CDN just for uh, caching and serving this Apple app site association file. Um, this also ensures, you know, like your server could potentially have downtime whereas CDNs have known strong connections that will not have downtime. Um, it also works around some really sort of gnarly edge cases where say, um, uh, say that there are two apps installed on the device, they each have universal links, but for one of them, the website associated with it is down uh, and for the other one, it's up. And this can lead to an inconsistent state in the system where it knows about the universal link associations for one app, but not another. Uh, and the system can stay in this inconsistent state for you know, uh, hours, days, or weeks um, until the system queries your domain again and your domain is up. So with a CDN in front of this, rather than receiving millions of requests and having to deal with the pitfalls of inconsistent state, um, your domain only receives a handful of requests from Apple's CDN that are then cached and served to the millions of iOS devices that are requesting them. Um, and Apple understands, of course, that you might not always desire this caching. For example, when you're in the middle of um, developing support for universal links, you definitely don't want this Apple app site association file to be cached. So Apple has built in a couple opts out for this. Um, so there are two opt outs that they've made. Uh, they're called developer mode and managed mode. So the first, of course, is while you're building your app and you don't want this data cached. And the second is if you're in some sort of MDM scenario. Um, and each of these relaxes the restrictions on uh, universal links. Um, and the way that you enable these, these different modes is you can add this query parameter, uh, mode equals developer, mode equals managed, or both, um, when you're defining the universal links within your app manifest file. Okay, so moving on to WebKit, Apple has added some new APIs that allow you to isolate the app content away from JavaScript content, which may be untrusted. So in general, if you are browsing to untrusted third-party content, you should be disabling JavaScript. Um, but if you are also showing some trusted first-party content, you might not want to disable JavaScript there. So previously, uh, pre-iOS 14, there was just a global switch to disable JavaScript, but now there's this new API. Um, WK Web Page Preferences allows content JavaScript that allows you to configure whether JavaScript is enabled or not on a per web page basis, so that you can only do this on on content that's you know not necessarily trusted uh, or that's third party, while retaining JavaScript on your trusted first party content. Um, the WebKit team also saw some issues where a malicious website would intentionally overwrite the JavaScript data and symbols that were injected by the application itself. And so they've now introduced this isolated context called WK Content World that the application and the web page can each run their JavaScript in uh, without interacting with or you know, being able to modify or see each other's code and data. Um, so both the application and the web page can still modify the DOM, can still interact with the page, but they can't overwrite each other's JavaScript and they can't you know, interact with each other in malicious ways. Um, so it's this new sandbox for JavaScript to execute that applies to both application JavaScript that's injected into the page, 
and web page JavaScript. Um, Apple has also expanded support for this uh, technology they developed, Intelligent Tracking Prevention, which uses client-side heuristics and machine learning to identify um, trackers that track users across the web. Um, so this was added to Safari in 2017, but uh, as of iOS 14 and macOS Big Sur, it's now enabled by default in WK WebView. Um, Apple also has this new feature called AppBound Domains. And so to explain this feature, they, they laid out some of the use cases for displaying web content within your application. So in the first case, in the broadest case, your application is a general purpose web browser that allows the user to browse to any site. And there's no, you know, there's no, there's no first party versus third party distinction. Um, in the next case, your site might be um, a locked site uh, as in everything is first party. Uh, and then thirdly, you might be a content aggregator stemming from a first party site where the user might start off on some first party domain, but then they can browse away to any external link on the site. And so to, to handle this better, Apple has introduced this new feature called AppBound Domains that allows you to define to the system which domains are first party versus third party. Uh, and if you do this by defining this list of WK AppBound Domains, uh, iOS will automatically disable some of these deep interaction APIs um, when browsing on third party domains. These APIs that get disabled are things like allowing the application to inject JavaScript or allowing the application to read um, and modify the cookie store. So all of this is disabled if the user is browsing within a third party untrusted domain. Um, and Apple claims that if you do load arbitrary web content, but don't need to you know, modify this content in any way, then doing this is a best practice. Um, so moving on, Apple has also added support for the web auth, the web standard that allows websites to leverage the platform biometrics like Touch ID and Face ID to perform authentication uh, on a website. Um, Apple has also been expanding support for sign in with Apple, uh, and it seems that users really enjoy the privacy centric features of this. Apple has said that more than 50% of users have opted to use the masked email feature of this, which uses a private email relay so that you can sign in to and use an app via sign in with Apple SSO without exposing to the app your real email address. Um, and then Apple also reminded developers of a security tip that developers should keep in mind um, when um, building a sign in with Apple Flow. So they said that developers should check this nonce and state value, set and check a nonce and state value on the sign-in with Apple Flow. And the idea here is that these are two uh, just randomly generated values that you uh, create at the start of the sign-in with Apple Flow and then check both locally and on the server um, during the flow. And what this does is it makes sure that an attacker cannot perform a replay attack um, on the sign-in with Apple Flow. So what would happen is that um, if an attacker tried to just resubmit exactly the same parameters that were ran on a legitimate um, sign-in flow, you would see that uh, those nonsense state values had already been used and that someone is trying to replay the login. So you would be able to deny this replay attack. Um, so Apple reminds developers um, to cross-reference these values, both uh, locally and on the server, state locally and nonce on the server, um, for improved security during, during the sign-in with Apple Flow. They also added Swift UI support to the sign-in with Apple button, allowing you to um, configure and present the sign in with Apple button with this nice declarative syntax. And they've also pointed out here uh, a Swift UI version of, of setting this nonce and state values that should later be checked. Um, and they also have this new online wizard that allows you to um, you know, create and configure a sign in with Apple button that you can then download and display in your app. Um, they also have this new one click upgrade path from sign in with Apple, uh, excuse me, from another SSO provider to sign in with Apple. Um, 
And they have this really cool feature that if they see that one of your existing passwords has been compromised in a data dump, then they have this one-click upgrade path uh, to sign in with Apple from the old SSO provider. Um, okay, so at WWDC this year, Apple also provided some security tips that developers should keep in mind when building apps. And we, of course, thought that it would be useful to pass these along to you as well. So Apple reminded developers to use App Transport Security. Uh, this is the mechanism that ensures that all the connections made by the app happen over HTTPS and to minimize any app transport security exemptions um, as these sort of you know, wipe away the security benefits that app transport security gives you. Um, they also ask developers to think about um, you know, what, what untrusted data that they work with and whether it should be validated. And just if you are trying to secure your app to threat model um, any attacker controlled data that you might need to validate or you know, further sanitize before processing it. Um, they also reminded developers to stay away from some APIs that have security issues. Um, so one of these is called NS coding. Um, and they asked developers to use its secure replacement, NS secure coding. But if you're not aware, NS coding is an object serialization and deserialization API. Uh, in other words, it allows you to save and restore code objects, um, you know, to disk or over the network or anything like that. Um, so it allows you to have, say, a dictionary in code um, and then save it to disk and then inflate it at a later date. Um, and the security issue here is that an attacker can produce one of these serialized payloads that when deserialized runs in attacker controlled code being executed. Um, so if you do use NS coding, uh, there's a risk of remote code execution for an attacker. Uh, and then a secure coding is the secure variant of the same protocol that fixes this issue. And the way that it fixes it is that when you do want to deserialize the object, you have to tell the system what classes you're expecting to deserialize. So if an attacker provided some malicious payload, that would deserialize to some uh, class that they controlled. If you told the system what classes you were expecting, the system can you know, safely and atomically reject that deserialization because they see that the payload contains some other type of class from what was expected. Um, and Apple also says that you should keep this list of allowed classes as sort of small and precise as possible because if you do provide a very sort of wide or overly generic list of allowed classes, once again, it wipes away the security benefits of this mechanism. Um, and then the NS Unarchiver API has a very similar issue. It's actually closely, closely related to NS coding. Um, and they remind developers to use NS keyed Unarchiver instead um, to get around the same issue. Apple also warned developers about broad classes of security bugs like path traversal vulnerabilities. And this is another one of those things where uh, we at Data Theorem really like to remind developers to be careful about what third-party SDKs you're bringing into your application. Uh, a couple of years ago, as it, as it turned out, there was a path traversal vulnerability within this very popular open source zipping SDK. Uh, which meant that all of these dozens and dozens of popular apps that were depending on this zipping SDK were also vulnerable to this path traversal attack. Um, this exploit was commonly referred to as zipper down. Um, and so if you did have this SDK embedded through no fault of your own, aside from using this SDK, you were also vulnerable. Um, so definitely audit your third party SDKs and be on the watch for stuff like this and use these safe variants of these path APIs um, to make sure that you're not gonna be vulnerable to this type of bug. Apple also reminded developers to be careful about format strings because if the data being formatted is, uh, is attacker controlled or otherwise unvalidated, it could lead to an attack uh, such as stack smashing or buffer overflows. Um, this isn't as much of an issue in iOS because like memory corruption, you know, doesn't, doesn't really give you so much on iOS as you're still operating within a sandbox. 
Um, but Apple did remind developers of it. And so we thought, of course, that we should pass it along to you as well. Um, so moving on to some of the really cool security features of the new Mac OS versions that run on Apple Silicon. Um, Apple has brought over some security features that originated on iOS to Mac OS. One of these being a technology referred to as KIP, Kernel Integrity Protection, which ensures that even in the case of an exploit, that the pages representing kernel memory are totally immutable. They cannot be overwritten uh, by an attacker, and this is enforced at the hardware level. Um, they've also uh, added support for um, something that they call write exclusive or execute pages. So one thing that you really don't want is for a page to be writable and executable at the same time, because it allows an attacker to do things like self-modifying code. Um, but this sort of thing is very useful if you're making, for example, a just-in-time JavaScript engine. Uh, so there is a need for this sort of thing. So they've introduced this very fast switch between um, a read and execute permission and a read and write permission so that JavaScript engines can still do fast JIT. Um, and another cool feature here is that uh, even though this, this is still a hardware enforced mechanism, two different threads that are running can simultaneously see two different sets of permissions for the same page. They brought over another technology from the ARM, uh, I think it's 8.3 standard called pointer authentication. So the way that this works is that Apple uses the high bits of a pointer to encode some, uh, some secure value that's generated. And then any time a function is returned from, they validate the, the, you know, these, these secure bits in the high part of the pointer. The idea being that this prevents an attacker from overriding the return address of a function because the attacker doesn't know um, what bits should be set in the pointer. Um, and they say that if you do have any kernel extensions on new versions of Mac OS, pointer authentication will be required to be enabled. Um, there's another change in terms of device isolation. So in previous uh, Mac OS architectures on x86, memory mapped IO devices, that is hardware devices that have been placed, uh, mapped into memory uh, at some bit of the address space, appear at the same part of the address space in every process. But on ARM, memory mapped devices are placed at unique addresses within the address space uh, in, in each process. So every process has a different view of where these devices are mapped. Uh, this means that if you have an info leak within one process, you're not able to exploit that within the context of another process. Um, kernel extensions are still supported on Apple Silicon, um, but they are more inconvenient to use. And Apple says that they will continue to become more inconvenient as time goes on. Um, Apple has also supported some more secure technologies like Secure Boot, uh, ensuring that every part of the boot process, from the boot ROM, the read-only memory flashed um, you know, at manufacturing time, all the way to the cryptographically signed operating system, um, are trusted, and that there's a chain of trust from the, you know, the root trust, the boot ROM, all the way to the booted OS. Um, and they've also added support for secure hibernation, which encrypts the context of RAM um, when the computer goes to sleep. And then lastly, Apple has introduced this new, really cool set of APIs called the Power and Performance APIs that allows you to aggregate metrics from all of the iOS devices across the world that are running your apps. And this allows you to do things like gather insights about, um, about the performance impact of your application and about the power impact when it's running on users' devices. So devices that have opted into data collection will send these metrics to Apple. Apple then anonymizes, aggregates, and vends this data to you via an API. And this allows you to create a highly customized analytics pipeline and even do things like automated regression tests and performance monitoring. And this breaks down over many metrics like disk rights, battery impact, launch time, and it even shows you breakdowns across different device types and percentiles. Um, they also have this feature called Smart Insights, which will analyze all of these metrics for you and automatically detect regressions. And then lastly, this one is really cool. 
Um, they have an API for diagnostic logs and they'll automatically pull out the stack traces that cause hotspots within your application. Um, so once again, consenting iOS devices report this data to Apple, which then vends it via the Me Metrikit APIs. Um, and there are four resources here. So you can see the metrics for recent app versions for a specific version, and then two kinds of di diagnostic logs. Um, and this is an image of, of exactly what this looks like in terms of the API. So you can see by reading this that the launch time trended up uh, for the 90th percentile on all iPhones. So you get this very detailed breakdown of how your app is performing um, across all iOS devices across the world. Um, so once again, this new power and performance API allows you to view and monitor these aggregated metrics to highlight the hotspots within your application. And then you also get these anonymized device logs that allow you to deep dive into the root issue of these hotspots. Okay, that's all the content that I wanted to go over today. Um, but in summary, uh, as we went over, iOS 14 adds a lot of um, controls for sensitive content stores on the user's device, as well as adding some more modern networking protocols um, and improving quality of life for some security features for the user. Uh, all of the content of this presentation is stuff that's going to be checked for within the Data Theorem Analyzer. But once again, we did want to give you this, uh, this heads up so, so that you would be aware of some of the new changes coming to the Analyzer this year over the next few months. Thank you.